I really love uh, more informal groups. I've spoken at a few universities that were just kind of a round table setting, and I hope um, when I'm done with my talk, it's bigger than the book. It's kind of just about me, and the book is a memoir of a, a few years and a, a few difficult times, but hopefully you guys can walk out of here with a, with a better perspective on not only the way that you approach uh, work, but the way that you approach life, because I think every moment is, is honestly and truly a gift, you know, and you can do, at any moment, you can change your life and, and make all of your dreams uh, realities. So, I always say I don't go anywhere without, um, without a little TV, and that's changed over the years, because literally a little TV now really means a little TV, <laughs> but I mean, I brought a little DVD for people who might not know me or might have never seen me on television. Here's a little bit about what I do and a little bit of my story. So please enjoy. It's about six minutes and then I'll talk on the other side. I've been on the job for well over a decade and I'm best known for my fun celebrity interviews. Is it because she won an Oscar? Because she's unbelievably hot. He goes, hot. <laughs> Would you dance with me? <laughs> they say that's my time. So far from Fresh Prince Day. Oh, no, you're, <laughs> you might be trying to mix it up a little bit, man. Try to mix it up. If you were trying to describe yourself to someone Meryl Streep is, how would you finish the sentence? <laughs> a little happy. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. But he's perfect. No one is perfect. And little did I know, my biggest imperfection would become my biggest story. Here we go. When most people see me on camera, I'm fully covered up, fully made up, except for my hands are exposed, and they look different. Well, here's what I really look like. This is my face without makeup. I have a disease called vitiligo. I was diagnosed with it about a decade ago, and it's gotten progressively worse. In fact, one day, I may be completely void of color, completely white. Now, one to two percent of the world's population has vitiligo. That's about 40 to 50 million people. And right here in the United States, two to five million people have this disorder. But I'm fighting back. Ready, Lee? Yep. Here we go. Close your eyes. Uh -huh. Every little boy seems to whisper the wheeze. Over the past five years, I've done various treatments, including the latest technology of life. Why am I telling my story now? Over the past few years, I've met or spoken with a number of kids and adults that have vitiligo. And many of them have told me that seeing me unafraid to be in the public eye and enjoying my job helps them. So frankly, I'm doing this report because a young man asked me to. I know of a kid who wears a mask to go outside and play because he's afraid of being teased. I spoke to a woman who will not leave her house because she has this disease. I know how they feel. Vitiligo is not contagious and it's not life-threatening, but it is psychological warfare. It's tough. So I hope that my story can be an extension of strength and, and courage. Yeah, the first 20 minutes of my day are spent in a makeup mirror, putting on makeup, getting ready for work. But I'm happy. This disease does not define me. So if you're dealing with a health challenge or vitiligo, live your life. Just make sure you have a little fun along the way. That's my story. That story aired in November of 2005. And when we televised my story, it got the biggest viewer response my station has ever seen. But that was only the beginning. We're back on Larry King Live. The book is Turning White, a memoir of change. The author is Lee Thomas. There was Larry and Montel. Welcome Lee Thomas back to the car. I also got a little TLC. My book and my story have traveled the globe. And I've even started a support group with part of the proceeds of the book going back to a charity that I started. But this journey has turned into so much more than a guy with a disease. It's a life-changing, heartwarming mission as I show myself unmade, unclothed, and unafraid for the whole world to see. I 
used to uh, look at these pictures and it would be like devastating. I would look at myself in the mirror and I would think that uh, you know people would see a monster or people wouldn't shake my hand or they wouldn't want to talk to me or ostracize me. But as time went on, I started to see myself differently. And it took a little bit of time, but where I saw disaster, I saw something that was shockingly beautiful in a way. It was almost like artwork. And where I saw destruction in the end of a television career, I, I began to see that this could be something that makes me so incredibly unique that I'm singularly defined, which is what we want in a television career. And I realized that people were simply looking at a, a citizen, a man, a, a good person. They were looking at a guy who works hard. They were looking at somebody who, you know, tries to do the best he can at everything. Um, and no matter what the obstacle was, or no matter what they saw, I knew they were looking at a good person because they were looking at me. Hit him with that million dollars smile. Like I <laughs> you know, you look at uh, my face and you look at a disease like vitiligo, which can be very devastating. And um, you think that it would be a showstopper. And for me, for a while, it, it was. Um, you know, there were times when I wouldn't go out of the house. There were times when it was difficult for me to see myself uh, or whatever you define yourself to be. But the outside coding is what you are closely defined with. And it was difficult for me to see myself. But as time went on, and I struggled through the different changes my body was going through. I am so much more clearly defined as a man, as a, as a father, as a brother, so much more clearly defined as an African American, as an individual, because I had to clearly define myself in my own mind and in my own heart that uh, who I was and what I stood for past what people saw, and even past what I saw when people saw me which was the most important thing and the most difficult thing that I think we all go through. Now, I've, I've traveled um, all over the world now talking uh, about my story and sharing my story uh, in the book or, or just in, in speech form. And I've realized in all this time, and I realized it pretty quickly, that we all have these things that uh, we think make us different. You know, the thing that you say, I can't, do this because of that, you know, whatever that is. It can be as something that's easily defined as a disease like vitiligo, or it can be something else. Some people think they're too fat, too skinny, can't see, not tall enough, not short enough, whatever, especially when it comes to hairdos or hair, and <laughs> all kinds of issues that we deal with that, that stop us from achieving that dream, you know, that stop you from saying, you know, I can't do it. And a lot of times you'll find that when you really sit down with that disaster, you'll find that the person that's stopping you is always you. It's, you're the one that says, well, I shouldn't go, I shouldn't do. Um, and you have to find a way to work yourself out of that, that self-imposed prison, because that's what I had found myself in. So uh, I'm going to go over a, a few of the obstacles that I face. And not only that, I'll go over how I, I overcame those obstacles and, and share some stories as well along the way. Um, I always say to people that it was not, was not easy. Um, getting past those, those issues are, are never easy. Um, and I always go to the, the darkest time for me, the most difficult part. And I wrote about it in the book. It's a section of the book that I actually posted online. It's called Two Little Girls, because in this situation, in these real life events, through these two little girls, it, it helped me to understand myself better and my situation. Um, one little girl, about two or three, a little cutie, like what you guys, um, a little cutie, she, we were, I was at a place gig, and I was just walking up to, to, I was actually getting ready to go to work, and I was on the way. I walked up and the kids were playing and I just came to, hey, well, let's watch some kids for a second before I have to go back to the news. So <laughs> I'm standing at this place gate and this little girl, she bumps into me. She kind of not watching what she's doing, you know how kids are. She bumped right into my legs and I look down at her, she looks up at me and she screams. Um, 
and if you've ever been around kids, you know there's different levels of scream. There's, just, there's the, okay, I'll get to that in a minute, scream, tell your brother to stop. There's the, okay, what did you just do and are you bleeding? And then there's the, drop everything and get the heck over there as soon as you can because something's seriously wrong with this kid, any adult. But that's the scream that she screamed. And she screamed so loud, everybody at the place keeps turning and looking at me. So I look down and I go, you know, I, I do what anybody else would do. I reach out, to, you know, what's wrong? And she screamed louder. And I realized that she was screaming because she saw my face. So what do you do with that? You know, because adults are, they're adults. They have their own issues and their own problems. And they bring those to you and they drop it at your doorstep and then they can leave them with themselves. Adults are no problem. They can do whatever they want and I can handle it. But a kid is pure honesty. I mean, the little girl was really afraid. So what do you, what do, you do with that? So I, I backed up, I, I put my hands by my side, and I said, somebody come help this kid. You know, I was the one that was making her scream. And when that happened, I went home, and I stayed home for two weeks and three days. I'd only put on my makeup, I'd go to work, I would, I would uh, do everything that I had to do, go to the grocery store, go any errands, then I'd go home, I'd take off my makeup, and I'd stay home. And for two weeks and three days, I lived like that. And that's like prison to me, but it was a self-imposed prison. But I didn't want to go around scaring small kids. You know what I mean? And it was tough for me to get my head around that. And I'm sitting there um, one afternoon after work, watching Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not afraid to admit it. <clears throat> and uh, I look over by the TV, and, and I see my, my gym shoes. Converse, not the Chucks, just the regular all stars, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I say that I, I, I just want to go and, and play basketball. You know, I just want to go play. And I can't not go because of this. I can't let this, you know, imprison me. So I decide that I'm going to go to the gym where I've been going for the last, you know, <coughs> years with all the guys. <laughs> And the guys have seen it go from one spot on my hand to a spot on my scalp to a spot on my face. They've seen it progress, and they don't care. As long as I hit my jump shot, we win, we're good. Um, so I go to the gym, and people look as much as they always did, but nobody, no, no kids were scared. No one cried, so it was okay. And I kept doing that. I'd go to places I had been before, the same grocery store I always go to, and I'd start venturing out a little bit more. And, um, you know, it became okay again to go out to the places I had been before. And so one day I'm at my favorite grocery store and I, I'm, uh, I'm reaching, trying to get the uh, ranch flavored rice cakes because I think they're scrumptious. And uh, second shelf from the bottom, I'm reaching back and they're, they're, you know, people tuck them in the back because they're trying to save them for themselves. <laughs> I don't get that, but I, knew they, I, I found a, you know, so I'm reaching in the back to grab the one ranch flavored one. and. Um, uh, I'm looking at the thing, at the rice cakes, and I hear a little voice go, you got a boo-boo? And I go, oh my god, it's a little kid, right? So, <laughs> what's going to happen? Am I going to look up, and is she going to freak out, and, and is she going to go screaming through the grocery store, and everybody's going to stare at me again? So I kind of froze there, and I go, okay, i got to do something. She says, you got a boo-boo? So I stood straight up and I go, no, it's not a boo-boo, I have a LIGO. About 1% of the world population has like 60 million people, but only 5 million in the United States, and I really was a like a three-year-old. <laughs> so I stop, and I go, I go, no, sweetie, it's, it's, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's not a boo-boo, it's, it's okay. And she says, it's not a boo-boo? And I go, no, it's not a boo-boo. She said, did it hurt? And I said, um, I looked at her mom and said, what? She goes, leave the man alone. I go, no, 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 this is good. <laughs> I just don't know what she said. She goes, she wants to know if it hurts. She says, does it hurt? I go, oh, yeah, it is, does it hurt? <laughs> so I, go, I, I bend down. You know, I get on one knee, and I say, no, no, sweetie, it doesn't hurt at all. I'm fine. She said, does it hurt? I go, I go, no. And she reaches out. She, she touches my face. And she, she kind of looks at it for a second, and she touches the dark part and the light part. And she goes, OK. <laughs> and turned around and grabbed a loaf of Wonder Bread. Apparently it was more interesting than me two seconds later. <laughs> but that's how kids are. And, and in the, those two little girls um, was the definition of dealing with 
this disease. Um, people have no idea what it is. I had no idea what it was. So I freaked out completely, fearful, not knowing what it meant. Uh, you know, thinking it was going to be the end of everything. I freaked out just as much as that little girl screaming. Um, but because the other little girl thought she knew what it was, uh, she had nothing but compassion and, and love. You know, she reached out and, and healed a grown man's pain with one touch. And because she thought she knew what it was, because it was a boo-boo to her, it wasn't anything of fear. And I got compassion and love and all these things that we all want anyway, even though sometimes we're too tough to admit it. <laughs> um, so right there I knew that if I could handle those two extremes, that I could handle uh, a life with this disease. Now, before that, I wasn't handling it very well. Um, it was difficult. Uh, I would be the, I called it, I called it the angry black white guy. Because <laughs> people would look at me and I would, I would give them the, you know, you know that mean look we all get when we're walking and we don't know anybody? Everybody puts that face on. You know, when you're, when you're 6'2 and 190, it's a little meaner, I guess. <laughs> I mean, you're African American, whatever, you give them the mean look and you really look mean. So I would look at people and they would give me the, you know, mean face or the scared, don't attack me face, which is definitely not what I was trying to get from people. But it was my own fear thinking that they were going to say something that was going to force me to be mean to them when I'm really not that kind of a guy. So I said, why am I giving this mean face to the public when it's really not even who I am? So I said, I'm going to hit him with the megawatt that got me on TV. The smile, baby. I'm going to hit him with that every time. I just said, that's, you know, from here on out, from this day forward, I'm not going to be the angry black white, white guy. I'm going to hit him with megawatt. You know what I mean? Bam. Every time it talks to news. Thank you very much. And from that day forward, since that little girl, I decided that, that, that that's what I was going to do. And everything changed. You know, people would come up and, and you're thinking, it's so weird. Like, you'll be in a situation and you'll automatically think you know what someone's thinking just by what they do. You don't know where they've been. You don't know if they're in some kind of physical pain. You don't know if they have a false leg or a bum eye. You just see a person looking at you funny and you go, well, that person obviously has boop. And all of a sudden, it's the definition of that person when you really have no idea what that person's life is like or what they're going through. So I said, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm just going to hit him with the mega white smile and see what I get. And I got a lot of good stuff. People would smile back. People would actually ask me, uh, is that vitiligo? Is that the same thing Michael Jackson has? Uh, I have a cousin that has that. I got 98% positive response from doing that. Oh, but there was the 2%, the people who had bad things to say. But most of the time, it was an adult that had their own issues uh, along the way. I'll, I'll give you an example. How flipping it around changed it for me. I, um, I was at a gas station, and you know when you're pumping gas, and there's that little space between you, the meter and the actual pump where you can see the other person, but you ignore them anyway. <laughs> you know, and you pump your gas, and they're like four feet away from you, pumping their gas, but you swear you're on two different planets. So you're like, so I'm doing my, you know, you pump your gas, I'll pump mine thing, and I'm, I'm thinking about work or something, and I'm kind of, you know, the lady across the way is like, giving me the stink face. <laughs> I call it the stink face because it's the face that you make when you smell something funky. <laughs> you know that one? She's giving me the stink face. And she's like burning a hole inside of my head with the stink face. So I like, I get hit her with the mega watch and she's like, Phew, you know? I'm like, okay, I'll just keep pumping my gas, you know? So she finishes staring at me and, and walks around to go pay for her gas and I'm still pumping my gas. So I, I hit her with the megawatt again, and, hey, you know. <laughs> and she goes, what is wrong with you? <laughs> I go, did I do the neck good enough? <laughs> so I look at her and I go, you know, besides the price of gas, I'm good. What's wrong with you? And she's like, hmm. Just walks off again, you know? <laughs> and ever, ever since that little girl, and ever since I changed my attitude, I have experiences like that where I walk away laughing, and the person walks away with whatever they walked up to me with. 
and they take it back with them and go back to their families, you know, God help them, um, to deal with all of that. But I, I walk away um, with, with dignity and humor intact, and those are two uh, really important things to me. So I found that dealing with that in those simple terms and, and taking those small bites when it comes to that is one way of, of my way of finding a positive path and something that could have been negative. The other thing about it is the truth of the matter is, is there's like 500 channels or more. I mean, you don't have Dish or whatever you have. I mean, there's Google TV. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, and there's like a zillion things that people could watch. And in that landscape of global television, because that's what it is, and in any instant we can call up a video from, you know, uh, China's Got Talent, and a million people will view it in a few hours, you know, a day. Um, there's a lot of things vying for people's attention today and honestly uh, as a television personality I, I want people's attention and I was I was thinking it it's 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 attention is a commodity in this world that we live in now and people will do it get try to get attention at all costs I'll just say two words reality television hello <laughs> they will try to get attention at all costs I mean Paris Hilton, what'd she do again? <laughs> but she is Paris Hilton, you know what I mean? I mean, attention at all costs is worth a, a lot in this day and age. Because it's really about just having that bit of some person's mental property in there where they go, oh yeah, I know that guy. Um, and that can sell uh, on, on whatever platform you have, on the web or whatever. And honestly, uh, I thought that this was going to be the end of my little bit of television, my small bit of TV real estate. I, uh, I got vitiligo when I had a job in Kentucky. I got a job in New York and hid that I had it. I only had it on my hand and on my scalp when I got to WABC in New York. Then uh, I would just put makeup on and nobody, nobody knew. When it got on my face, completely freaked out. I mean, I was walking in Central Park talking to myself, no way, I'm going to trucking school or what am I going to do now? You know, and, uh, you know, people are looking at me like, why is that guy dressed so nice to be homeless? <laughs> I'm like, no, no, I'm just you know, going through something, don't worry about it. I sat on the bench and I really, I took my whole lunch break the day I, I was completely diagnosed saying, this is vitiligo, it's not curable, what are you going to do? My whole lunch break I was sitting in the park talking to myself, thinking that, you know, it's over. You know, I worked my way through college, I paid for it myself, I got my job in TV and I've been working ever since doing pretty much entertainment reporting and anchoring, which is exactly what I wanted to do. Dream come true kind of scenario. So when I got the diagnosis, I thought it was done. You know, how can a, a guy with this kind of disease, with this darker skin, and the, the transition is going to be crazy, and one day it's going to be, you know, I'll be sitting on some island with a, a hat that says, you know, press on the front, one of those newsboy caps, when I used to be on TV, <laughs> trying to impress people at a bar. I mean, that's what I thought was my future. And, and it was hard for me to, to shake that, that image in, in my head. But honestly, this uh, situation that has happened to me, this disease, has made me not only the global spokesperson for this disease, which is a very difficult disease for many people in a lot of countries. There are still countries uh, on this globe that think uh, vitiligo is leprosy and ostracized or even worse to the person who has it in that culture. So I've become the face of this disease on a global, uh, a global platform. And also, I, I have become, for whatever little bit of mental real estate that means, when people, uh, people go, <clears throat> I've had people come to work with me that say, you know, my dad knows your story. He read your book. And, and, and he asked me if I was coming to the station to work with you. And you're the first person I sought out when I came here because I had heard your story. I was in an airport in Germany, and this guy comes up and says, Thomas! And I'm like, oh man, I'm going to get taken down in Germany. <laughs> Where's my mom's number? You know. um, but uh, he, he gives me hugs. I see you on the Later King. You are incredible. <laughs> and I'm like, that's awesome, because I really thought I was going to go to customs on this. <laughs> he gives me a hug. It's incredible how 
now I've become a, a, a television personality from Detroit, without a doubt. But now people know all over the globe from Australia to Taiwan who I am. I've spoken to groups in, uh, last month I was in Italy, month before that I was in Toronto. You know, I've been going all over the country and the globe for that matter. Um, I'm sharing my story. And I can say that, that what I thought was going to be the worst devastating show-stopping thing in my life has turned out to be one of the biggest blessings that I've ever had. And it's incredible to even say that now. You know, it feels funny even coming out, but it's, it's the absolute truth. It's made me so much of a better man than I was before in the shallow television world. I'm doing an interview with a, a Hollywood actress, um, and, and she's got a pimple. <laughs> like, like right by her nose, you know, right in this area. <laughs> and she, like the makeup artist comes in, and the other makeup artist comes in. She's like, I can't see it. <laughs> no, mind you, this is in between my interview and someone else's interview, so I have to sit in the chair, and I'm sitting there like, trying not to laugh, you know. She's like, what? I'm like, if you knew what my face looked like under this makeup, that pimple's like small potatoes. She goes, I know, but you have to look. This is Hollywood. And I go, I know. It's Hollywood. It's the way that people view you. But, but the thing that could have been most devastating for me turned out to be um, the, the most incredible. The most incredible. I, I say, I, I share that story, especially when I speak to people at companies, because sometimes when you're in the midst of a situation, um, a difficult task, and you look at the difficulties of that task, you, you pull yourself away from it and pull the emotion away from the task, and you might find a gem in there that you would not have noticed because it was such a devastating bad thing two seconds ago. But if you pull yourself away from it and try to look at it at every angle, different angles, all of a sudden an angle will come out that you never would have thought of. I mean, sitting at this table, I still can't believe I still have my job. It's incredible. 125,000 people every 15 minutes watch the number one morning show in Detroit. Fox 2 News News work for you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I never would have thought that, <laughs> like I said, that's <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, well, uh, I never would have thought that I would be able to maintain my job and, um, and, and look like this and have this disease and slowly change over time. Um, but it's turned out to be the singular defining thing that defines not only me, uh, it defines how great the, my boss and our general manager are. Because from day one, they've been nothing but supportive. Because I, I, when it started getting worse, when I couldn't hide it anymore, I'd go into my boss's office and I would say, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay on TV doing this. And she goes, we love what you do. We love your work. Whatever you decide to do, we're going to support you. But we want you on our television station. Cool. Just checking. Good to know. <laughs> you know? Um, and I always, especially when I talk to younger kids, I, I try to tell them to have, have what I call their, their high counsel. Because there's a lot of people who say a lot of stuff. I'm talking about attention. You can hear opinions from anywhere. Just click on your computer and you know, Google something. You've got a, a zillion opinions on everything. But you, you can't listen to them. You have to pick your high counsel and listen to those people. And it's usually someone that has a stake in you, uh, someone who has some kind of emotional stake in you, family, or just a really good friend who is that honest person. And for me, it, it was my sister Beverly. She, she has made me more money. One time I was trying to negotiate a contract, and I called my sister, and she goes, you can't live on that. Ask for 20 grand more. I'm like, are you serious? She goes, just try it. See what happens. But be nice when you say it. <laughs> I called her back. I'm like, get out of here. Buy a Jeep. <laughs> you know? Um, but my sister has always been very honest with me. And I said to her, I don't know if I can continue to do this. You know, I don't know if I can stay doing this. And she goes, why? Has, has the big boss, that's the guy in the biggest office, I call him the big boss, the general manager, <laughs> has the big boss said anything? And I go, no, they've been, they're still very supportive. And um, she goes, well, has, has the boss said anything? Has she said anything? And my boss uh, is a news director, my direct boss. And I go, no, she's, they've been very supportive. She said, have any of your coworkers said that you need to quit because you have the LIGO? And I go, no, not to my face, they didn't. She goes, well, the only person I hear saying it is you, so stop saying it. 
You know, just stop saying it. Stop saying it, stop thinking it, stop acting that way. Act like it's your job and that you're going to have it for a long time. Even if you don't believe it right now, just act that way. And it changed. And once again, just a simple thing is perspective. I, I beg to say, I don't beg to say it, I'll just say it, <laughs> that you can't define something as negative until you define it as negative. Up until that point, it's just something that happened. Up until that point, it's just something that happened. You can walk out of this room right now and, and slip and, and, and fall right there in the hallway. You can get up and go, I cannot believe it just happened. Uh, why does this kind of stuff always happen to me? But what if, while you were slipping and falling in the hallway and doing all that stuff, there was something in your office that was much worse that would have happened if you wouldn't have fallen in the hallway. But you don't know that because you're too busy worried about what just happened in the hallway to know that you just avoided something much worse that if you slipped and fell in your office and hit the side of your desk that you'd be at the hospital. So it's all about the perspective on a situation because things happen in life. Nothing's going to be smooth sailing ever. It's all about how you prescribe uh, feelings or emotions around that situation and and what you what weight you give it I always say to people that if you I have this thing I call a five second five minute rule you get five seconds to let it all out when something happens because things happen and you have emotions and you have to deal with those emotions you take five seconds and sometimes you may want to go somewhere by yourself and just let it all out Whatever you want to say, however you want to say it, let it happen. Stop at five seconds and then take five minutes to get over it. If you need five minutes to get over it, you know, whatever it takes. Call your best friend, write it in your journal, which I highly recommend. Um, but take those five minutes and really get over it. I don't mean go over it. I mean get over it. Meaning that situation happened. It's not defining who I am. It's just the situation that happened. And if you can figure out why it happened, do that, whatever the situation is, and then change that situation's outcome by the end of that five minutes and go, you know what, I'm glad this, this, and this didn't happen and that's the only thing that happened. And make it something better in that five minutes. And then after five minutes, let it go. L-I-G. I was interviewing a Snoop Dogg once. He said, L-I-G, brother. <laughs> like, what? Let it go. <laughs> Let it go. Don't go back and go, man, it's, this, this happened two weeks ago, and it's happening again in two weeks. Let it go. Let it go. If you go over your life, there's some things you do over and over all the time. You have it every day. You get up, you take a shower, you brush your teeth, sometimes you don't, sometimes you don't take a shower. You're still alive. You still have the opportunity to live. Don't prescribe all these bad things to that one moment that's going to devastate your life. Um, and, and in five minutes, really let it go. And sometimes that's hard to do. Because what happened is tough. And what I do is I, it, it sounds uh, kind of funny, but I call it a, a happy thought. And whatever that happy thought can be. And for, and for me, I have a two-year-old daughter, and she cracks me up just looking at a picture of her. <laughs> but whatever that is for you, for, for a, a guy I was at a, at a, at a company in there, I was asking people what could be your happy thought for, for a guy it was a car that he was working on. Because every time he goes to work on that car, it just, it just makes, him, makes him happy. It could be your mom, it could be your dog, it could be your house. It could be a walk on the beach you had with your sister, your mother, your girlfriend, your wife, your husband. But whatever that happy thought is, after that five minutes, go there and live there for a couple minutes. So that you come out of it on the other side of it, realizing that I'm still here, they're still here, life is still good, I'm going to go home and my daughter's going to give me a hug. You know, whatever just happens, small potatoes compared to her well-being. I mean, I might have fallen in the hall, somebody might have said something a bit flippant to me about the way that I look, but they don't sign my paycheck. And what they said is not going to hurt my daughter, it's <coughs> hurt me. So I move right on and I don't, I don't harbor. I don't harbor any of those emotions. And I just like sharing, sharing stories in that way because maybe that's something that you can take with you as you try to uh, overcome obstacles, not only in your life, but at work. It makes, it makes the things that happen at work so much smaller. 
um, when you big picture, when you big picture something. Um, another thing that I end up talking about. <laughs> Another thing that I, I ended up talking about a lot is um, is Michael Jackson. Uh, he had the disease with LIGO. He talked about different venues. And for some reason, people just will not believe it. Will not believe it. I say to people, what if you were the most popular person on the planet? Your album Thriller is out. And there's this album cover with you, you know, baddest dude in the world. Women are fainting at your sight. Albums are selling like hotcakes. But you have a secret. You really look like this instead of that. What do you do for all of those millions of fans? For all of those millions of fans. And if you're in Hollywood, you hide it. You fix it. That's the way they do things. I mean, they fix it everything. Nose, but everything else. Hair. Uh, you fix it. So I, I understand why he hid. I'm pretty sure that's what the people around him told him to do, was to hide it. Um, I understand how it became more difficult for him. I also understand why the people who loved him protected him. Because people do it for me. It's so funny. I was at a... I was at a uh, gas station trying to get gas, and I'm, I walk in to pay for my gas, and the guy behind the counter goes, oh, come on, you cut this out. I'm like, what? I just, 30 on bump three. No, no, stop this with the face thing. You have you have the Halloween mask on. I'm like, no, dude, it's, it's not Halloween, really. 30 on pump three. He's just like, he's like, no, 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 take this stuff off your face. This is the best makeup I've ever seen. Take this off your face now. Hey, come here, look at this guy. Come here, come here. Some other guy comes in, oh, look at this. Is this a Halloween mask? I'm like, no. oh, God, I really just want gas. You guys are really funny. <laughs> Should be on Letterman, but I, I want I want gas. Uh, no 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 no. So the guy there was two ladies behind me and another guy. The guy literally pushes me out of the way and goes, "Do you know who this is? Do you know who this guy is?" And I go, "Please don't, no no, don't, don't go that route, please, no, please." I just just what thirty or three, please. <laughs> And the lady's like, mm, I can't believe they're saying that. This must be something you do. You should call the problem solvers on them. Get a camera down here. They're wrong. They're wrong. They're wrong. They don't know that you're Lee Thomas. And the guy's like, he is Lee Thomas. And I'm like, oh, my God. And then they realize that, you know, that, I, that it's me, that I have a disease. Not that I'm Lee Thomas, that I think the three people over the other side of the counter would mug them if they didn't just give me my gag. So they, they take my $30 real quick and say, thank you. And I walk off laughing, going, you people are great. Oh, I can't you follow me around all the time. It's very entertaining. <laughs> but the, the, the way that people react to the way that you look is, is incredible. So could you imagine being Michael Jackson with all that? I mean, really. I, uh, when I first got the disease, I got one spot. Um, I got a spot on my scalp. I got two on my scalp. And then I got one on my hand, probably the size of a quarter. And uh, so... This was one of the worst ones that happened while I was here in Detroit. And it was like early September, and I wore one glove to do my live shots. So I'd hold the, the mic with the gloved hand so I could shake people's hand with this hand. Uh, and the gloved hand was covering the spot. <laughs> so, and so I was reading on Michael Jackson and, and Michael Jackson's friends. And one of his friends had said that the reason he wore the one glove that became a fashion statement is because he had a spot on his hand and he couldn't put makeup on because it kept coming off. So he, he made this, he just didn't want to wear a glove. He, he was, you know, an entertainer, so he had to wear a bedazzled glove. <laughs> you know, but, but he was really just covering the vitiligo. Then for me, it went from one hand to two hands, and I tried the two glove thing, but it really wasn't that season for that either. If people write in, why is Lee Thomas wearing gloves and it's not cold? <laughs> Thanks a lot, internet people. <laughs> Skin. <laughs> but, uh, so people were writing in, so I had, to get, I had to get rid of the gloves. I had to go, you know what, they're just going to see the spots on my hands. But Michael Jackson, remember, he went to two gloves. Went to two gloves for a long time. The other thing that I end up vouching for him a lot for is that um, 
one of the procedures for this disease is that if you get it in uh, over 80% of your body, meaning that there's only 20% pigment left, that you bleach out the rest. But the problem with that is you have to continue to bleach because you're, even though it's not making a lot of pigment, your body still tries to make pigment. So you'll get spots of pigment all over your body. And, but once, and also once you bleach the rest out so that you're uniform, uh, your skin becomes really sensitive to the sun. So you have to use hats and umbrellas and scarves to cover up when you go out in the sun. I have to carry a hat everywhere I go because you can see through my scalp that it's gone and it, it burns like that, you know. I can't go cover a you know, U of M game or anyone for that matter on a hot sunny day and stay out in the sun for a two hour newscast after you get in the truck and get in and out of the truck because it'll, it'll really uh, give me a, a severe sunburn. And he had to deal with the same thing. He had to deal with the same thing. But it all fell in the weird category. And he never really, and no one ever really addressed it with him in any uh, in-depth fashion. So as I tour the world, I end up going, yes, yes, it's one of the, yes, he bleached his skin. Wow, watching for Michael Jackson, huh? <laughs> so one day I'm, 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 um, I'm, uh, I'm at my desk and um, and, uh, I think it was CNN or one of the, or, or USA Today or one of those, one of those newspapers, websites or whatever, I had called and, uh, and I answered the phone and they go, well, Quincy Jones says Michael Jackson wants to be white. Do you have a comment? And I'm like, you want me to refute Quincy Jones? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, first of all, he's one of the best music producers I've ever heard in my life. I love him. And there's nothing I could do. He could crush me like a bug without even thinking. <laughs> you know. Second, he's off his rocker. The guy had a disease. Michael Jackson had vitiligo. He was not trying to be white. He was just turning white. It wasn't a choice. You know? He would never said he wasn't an African American. He addressed the disease to Oprah Winfrey and to Martin Bashir in two different interviews. But he has so much other stuff going on that he said, I have vitiligo. And the next sentence was, so you have sleepovers. You know? It was just not ever really addressed. So it gives you a different perspective and for me it gave me a different perspective meaning that I cannot hide because if you hide it lets people draw their own conclusions and man their conclusions can be way out there way out there you know so not that he did the wrong thing because I think each person has to define what's best for them and I'm not saying the way that I treated this situation or I treat this situation is the right way to do it but uh, he was a great example of what not to do for me. I mean, then when he died, I had a whole other set of interviews where people would just talk about little I go, you know, and, and hopefully, you know, one day people will stop, will stop asking me because it's understood. Or even better, even better, it's cured. How are we doing with time? So we, we have about 10 minutes left, okay. so if you have a couple of key things, or if you want to just open it up to questions, it's, mm -hmm. it's up to you. Uh, I'm sure you guys might have some questions, yeah? yeah. No? Yeah? No? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll leave you with this real quickly. Um, real quickly. As I, you can tell, I talk for a living, so I love talking. <laughs> but um, if, if you walk out of this room with anything, um, hopefully you'll walk out realizing that there are, are some insurmountable things or seemingly insurmountable things that happen throughout a lifetime that make you think that you cannot do. And I say not only do, but dream. Because uh, not only is it going to make you happy to do and live your dreams, but I really feel like we need each other to live our dreams. Because I wouldn't be driving a car if it wasn't for the guy who dreamed of making a car. Not only that, dreamed of making it affordable for everyone to be able to drive a car. We wouldn't be sitting here if Al Gore didn't in, uh, invent the internet for us to use. <laughs> that's still funny, isn't it? <laughs> Years later, that's still funny. <laughs> but uh, I only say that to say that it's, it, it's up to you to figure out how to get past your obstacles at work, at home, wherever you are. Um, 
but we help each other in every way. If you subtract money from the equation, I know that's hard to do, so please bear with me for a moment. If you subtract money from the equation, there's not one part of your life that's not uh, bent on somebody else, that's not up to someone else. Did you grow all the food you eat? Guess and no. Somebody else did. Did you make the clothes you're wearing right now? Guess and not. Somebody else pretty much made those. Um, anything, when you go get in your car, did you you know, drill for oil and turn it into petroleum and put the gas in there for you to drive home. I mean, you look in your refrigerator and it's like a, a slice of the globe. You could have oranges from somewhere in South America. You could have containers from China. All these things that you use on a daily basis that you do on a daily basis from, from haircuts to shoes are based on someone helping you, subtracting money from the situation. So I say, not only find a way past your difficulties, living your best life actually helps me and you and you and you and you. It helps each other, especially in a work environment like that, like this, where you guys are. It, it, it literally does. It literally does. Because you know you're in a work group situation and someone has a problem and that problem becomes the one where they go and talk about the problem to the next person and that problem becomes the problem that's talked about by the next person and it comes, then you know, the next day you come to work and you find out that you have a fake leg and you really couldn't walk when you made that decision because that's how far the story has gone when if the first person with the problem didn't call it a problem then it wouldn't be a problem it would be a situation that we're all helping with so it's just a perspective thing that changes lives and it, and, and it changed mine it, it did change mine so we can have some questions Anyone? No, everyone looks at me. Is that? I always have <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> Or I say something dumb. <laughs> 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 um, well, I just have a question. How do you? How has the reaction been? Because you do deal with so many celebrities. Mm -hmm. Has the reaction um, in your journey been different in that spotlight with celebrities? It has. Us every day. It, on the it, it has. I walk in, and this has happened a f more than a few times since. But the first time it happened. Uh, I walk in to interview George Clooney for Leatherheads, which I didn't think was a bad movie. I thought it was okay. Uh, but I just like Clooney. Um, and uh, I walk in the room, he goes, Hey, Lee, man, I knew you were coming, and I, I've been watching your story. Uh, you were on 2020, and I saw you on Larry King. Man, I have a, one of my best friends has vitiligo. He's had it all his life, and he almost stopped acting because he had this. So what you're doing is a good thing. Don't stop doing that. Just don't, don't stop. Before I even sat down on the chair, he said, don't stop doing that. You're doing a great job at that. Keep doing that. And I go, you're George Clooney. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just start laughing. He goes, yeah, but I pay attention. You know, he's just an astute guy. He pays attention to the news as well. And it was just weird that the first minute of my interview was George Clooney talking to me about me. So naturally I go, so he was talking for the first minute. Do I get another minute here? Because I only have seven minutes, George. You just killed one of mine talking about me, man. <laughs> I go, Unless I can use that. He goes, yeah, yeah, use it, use it. I'm like, okay, good, because I only got a few minutes here, brother. <laughs> that happened with Ashton Kutcher. It's happened with Loretta Devine. Um, it's just, uh, what's, what's the guy's name? Just was in there. Uh, his name is Donald Loge. Uh, same, he, he, he's, he's a great actor, isn't he? Great actor. But anyway, he was just in studio the other day, and he did the same thing. He goes, oh man, I saw your story. I thought you worked in Atlanta. I go, no, I've been here in Detroit. So when you told your story, it was from Detroit. And I go, and we're live with Donald Lowe's. We're going to talk about his television show coming up, right, Donald? You know, right? <laughs> like, of course we are. You know, it, it, that's the, the thing that's made it a little, a little weird when people... They've seen my story, and and I've I've never had a, a, a negative response from from the celebrities who see my story when they bring it up. Now there have been some celebrities that don't want to shake my hand for whatever reason. It's happened. Uh, I went. I'll tell you this story because it turns out well because I've never dumped on anybody. But I went to <laughs> I went to shake shake uh, Seth Green's hand, and then and I shake his hand. He looks at my hand. He goes, "What's your deal?" 
<laughs> and I go, what's my deal? What do you mean? He goes, what's with the white hair and black, black face thing? And I go, oh, go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I go, I have a disease called Bill. I go, who's Bill? I go, I know what that is. He goes, it turns you completely. I go, yeah, completely. He goes, well, one of my buddies has that. And he started getting spots everywhere. He freaked out. He says, is that what that is? I go, yeah, yeah. I go, so you heard of it? He goes, yeah, Michael Jackson had that, man. I go, I know. <laughs> and I go, can I get another minute here? Because that just killed one of my minutes. <laughs> They're really tight on time, yeah. but it's been it's been incredible. It really has. It really has. Yeah. Hmm? Um, I wanted to know, like, how his like specifically to the African American community kind of reacted to the disease, since it's I think for African Americans it's much more obvious mm -hmm. when the when we have people it. color, yeah. Yeah, it, it's it, it's been very very embracing. I made a, a bestseller list. My book made a bestseller list, and mm -hmm. it was the Essence bestseller list. <laughs> Which was very cool. <laughs> it was very cool. So, ladies of Essence, we read my book. <laughs> How you doing, girl? Uh, so no, it's, 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 been, it's been really, <laughs> it's been really, really cool because I think that a lot of times, whatever community it is, but especially the African American community, didn't have a lot of information about the disease. And Michael Jackson, when it comes to the disease, because they've interviewed him before, Essence specifically, and, and Ebony and all, all the African American publications, but no one really talks to him about this. So I've been in Jet Ebony, I've been in Essence, I've been in all these magazines, and they featured me in different ways, NLBET and all this stuff, um, kind of giving people the, the real skinny on vitiligo, and, and, and every one of them asked about Michael Jackson. Because it, and the other thing it helped me do is to clearly define myself as an African-American man, because no matter how much my pigment goes away, I'm still going to be that, just as much as, as, as someone's Italian-American or, or you know, is, Israeli-American or whatever you might be. It's not going to go away just because your pigment goes away. So I had to clearly, clearly you know, define that. It's funny because I was on a plane, a long plane ride back from London, and a guy, uh, a guy was uh, sitting next to me. He ended up being a college professor at State, and uh, and so we were talking back and forth. And after he figured I was cool, he goes, "Can I ask you a question?" I go, "You know, shoot." He says, "Are you are you a, a black guy turning white or a white guy turning black?" Because I'm on a I'm on a plane. I always wear a hoodie, and all as you can see is pretty much this, right? So he sees this and my hands, and he goes, "I have no idea. Which one are you?" And I go, "I'm my brother, man." <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me poopy. <laughs> But it's really uh, a question when, you're, when your pigment goes away. And a lot of people that not only African Americans, but there's a, a large Indian uh, population. Uh, there's a, one city in India specifically that has a large portion of their population that has vitiligo. And even though their skin isn't as dark as mine, it's still devastating, uh, devastating disease when you start watching your pigment, especially a, an African American man, a dark skinned African American man, when you're so clearly defined by the the color of your skin. Yeah. Um, so when it starts going away, you have to go, okay. So it could be mean? the other way too. It could be, um, let's say you're of European descent, mm -hmm. your pigment could become darker mm -hmm. too. So yeah. it's, oh, really? there is a disease, not vitiligo, but there okay. is a disease that can turn, make your pigment get uh, hyperpigmentation, uh -huh. where you get darker than, than you would want to be. But it's not going to go like a, a person with with, with white skin gets dark like an African American. Okay. They would get dark like a dark, dark tan, as dark as they could get. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so there, there is diseases that can, that can do that as well. As I said earlier, I've seen always the news quite a bit. And, um, you know, if you didn't, if you know, people hadn't seen your story, they would never know. Right. Have you ever given any thought to, is there any, I mean, what's the reason why you, you know, Don't. Yeah. The reason why I, um, I still wear makeup on television is because you know, I'll talk to everybody and their granddad about it, but there is a portion of the population who can't get past it. Mm -hmm. There are people who can't hear what I'm saying because of it. And it's funny because I, I can tell when somebody just can't get past it, so I'll be standing in a group of people and one person will be staring at like my ear the whole time, <laughs> going like this. <laughs> you can tell they think it's on, it's on his ear, it's on his neck, and look at his scalp, it's so, and they're just gone. Uh, and because of that, if, if I were to do that to where it distracted from whatever I'm talking about, 
you know, I'm a journalist and the story isn't really about me. It's about whatever I'm talking about. So if they're paying attention to me, I'm not doing my job right. So that's why I still wear it. But Hugh Perkins wears up and down. You should just go on TV and just <laughs> <laughs> and go, Hugh, if I made as much money as you make, I would just go on TV. And if I got bounced, I would call it.